All right, welcome to today's lesson on recursion. So, what is recursion? Well, first, to understand recursion, we must first understand recursion. Well, perhaps a definition will help us. The act of defining a process, at least in partly in terms of itself. This is rather similar to recursion, but with subtle differences. If that's a little bit too wordy for you, I can simplify that again. Recursion, see recursion. And now, for those of you who don't find me funny whatsoever, you can skip to the next slide where I'll give you an actual definition for recursion. Recursion is an algorithm where a method is going to call itself as part of the solution to a problem. Okay? This is going to allow us to solve quite complex problems by using a single method that is going to be iterative in its response. So basically, this is a form of looping. But instead of having a for or a while loop, the looping occurs by having the method call itself again and again and again and again. The key here is that when this loop uh, is occurring, when the method is calling itself, it is calling a simpler version of the method it already called. And it keeps getting simpler and simpler and simpler until we get to a base case, which is the simplest possible version of that problem. And that would then lead us to our overall solution. So for those who are still kind of like going, I don't get what you're talking about, let's take a look at a mathematical example of recursion. So this example will be factorials in math. We all know that one factorial is in itself one. But if I try and make this problem a little bit more complex, I can say, well, what's two factorial? Well, two factorial is two times one. I can rewrite this as a simpler version by saying two factorial is two times one factorial. Moving up, we can say, well, what's 3 factorial? Well, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. And again, I can simplify this by saying 3 factorial is 3 times 2 factorial, which I can solve by saying 2 factorial is 2 times 1 factorial, which is 1. And you can see how this continues on. So 4 factorial will be 4 times 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2 factorial, which is 2 times 1 factorial, which is 1, which can then be used to solve. Well, 1 goes into this one, which was suspended and said 1 times 2, and then 1 times 2 is 2, which goes to 3, 2 times 3 is 6, 6 can be used here because it's 3 factorial with 6, 6 times 4 is 24, that solution can be used, and so on. So what you can basically see here, hopefully, is that each line coming down here can be solved in terms of the previous line that came before it. So I can solve 4 factorial if I can solve 3 factorial, which can be solved by solving 2 factorial, which can be solved by solving 1 factorial, which is a 1. I take that answer, 1 factorial is 1, so 1 times 2, 1 times 2 is 2, I can take that answer, put it here, 2 times 3 is 6, take that answer, put it here, 6 times 4 is 24, and there's my answer for 4 factorial, it's 24. We just solve 4 factorial using recursion. But what would this look like using code? Well, to code this, we have to have a method. And the method, first of all, must solve our problem by breaking it down into simpler problems of the same type. So again, looking here, to solve 4 factorial, I have to break it down into something simpler, which would be 4 times 3 factorial. And then I take that 3 factorial, which is the same method again, and solve it by making it simpler, 3 times 2 factorial, and so on. In a recursive method, I must have a base case that is eventually reached for each recursive call. So the base case is the most simplistic version of that solution. So again, in this example here, my base case is 1 factorial. 1 factorial, by definition, is 1. I cannot simplify this any further. So this becomes my base case. All my other factorial methods are going to be called moving towards getting to that base case. And as I said earlier, this makes a repetition structure. But instead of using while and for loops, it's going to call itself over and over again by using if statements. So what does it look like as an actual method? So here's the method itself. Public static returns an int. It's called factorial, requires an int. It's important here that things are going to match. So it's going to use that integer to solve itself. So let's take a look. In order to solve this, I first write down what my base case here. So this here is my base case. The simplest option is n is 1. So I'm trying to solve for a factorial of 1. If I'm trying to solve 1 factorial, we know that 1 factorial is 1, so I can return a 1. Otherwise, if it is something more complex than that, then I'm going to have my recursive call down here. So 1 factorial, so let's say, for example, 2 factorial. 2 factorial we just saw is 2 so the number you're passing me, times the factorial of 1 less than whatever my value is. So in this case, 2 factorial will be 2 times 1 factorial. 
or 4 factorial would be 4 times 3 factorial. Okay, that would then be so, so 4 times 3 factorial, then I would solve 3 factorial would be 3 times 2 factorial, 2 factorial is 2 times 1 factorial, 1 factorial is 1, that answer gets put back into the original version of what was 2 factorial, and so on, and moving back up. Okay, so how does this process, let's, let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Recursion involves the internal use of a stack. So stack is a data abstraction. So it's an idea of how to store data in our computer. And in a stack, think of it like a, a stack of uh, pancakes or a stack of plates. Okay? Any new piece of data or a new pancake is pushed or added to the top of the stack of previous pancakes or previous sets of data. When I want to take information off my stack of pancakes, I have to start at the top. I can't take the bottom pancake out, otherwise the whole tower of pancakes will fall over. So I have to take the top piece, we call that popping it off the top of the stack. And then I can use that one, and then the next time I want a piece of information, I pop it off the top of the stack, working my way backwards down to my original piece, which is at the bottom of the stack. Okay, so in our recursion, if I have a recursive method, and it's going to call itself, the original method, so 4 factorial, would be stored in a data abstraction. It would then call 3 factorial. 3 factorial would then be stored on top of the stack, right? And then I would have, it would call 2 factorial, which would then get put on top of that stack, which would call 1 factorial. I'd get an answer that would then pop off the top of the stack my waiting 2 factorial method. The 1 would get put into that, that method, and then it would be solved. The answer to that would be returned to the next one waiting on the top of my stack, which is 3 factorial. It would get popped off, and so on. Okay? So basically, the current computation is temporarily suspended. So that 4 factorial that I don't have an answer to, it gets suspended. It's held in, sp in, in space and time. It's held in memory. Okay? It's placed on the stack with all the current information available for later use. A new copy of the method is now called and is going to try and evaluate that recursive call, the simpler version of that method. And it keeps doing that over and over again until the base case is encountered and then the recursion will then unwind and go in the reverse order using each solution to solve the um, temporarily suspended method that was waiting from before until finally you end up with a final answer. Okay. Each time, the value that's returned by a recursive call is used to solve the suspended computation that's at the top of the stack. So maybe I can show you what this looks like. Oh, here, we'll go, we'll go back here a little bit into our program. And let's say I have my four factorial. So I'm going to go fact four. Right? I want to try and solve that. That is going to come down here. And it's going to say, because n doesn't equal 1, it's going to go and say, well, I want to do this. So this gets suspended and put onto the top of my stack. So my 4, I'll put that here, is on the top of the stack. So it's now going to solve for factorial. So this is going to be 4 times. It's going to wait until we solve this. So 4 factorial now goes on and says, well, OK, got to solve factorial 3. Okay. Well, factorial 3 can't get solved. It has to go down here. So we know that factorial 3 is basically going to be equal to, um, well, this was, sorry, this was 4 times factorial 3. So factorial 3, this one gets paused now, and it's going to be equal to, I go to the top of the stack up here, it's going to be 3 times the factorial of 2 which would then go and say, well, that's going to be 2 times the factorial of 1. So you can see how I've made a stack of things up here. We know that 1 factorial is going to be 1. So this substitutes and solves as a 1. That 1 gets put back into the suspended version of factorial. We get 2 times 1. 2 times 1 equals 2. This solution now gets placed in place of where the suspended computation was, which is here. So this now becomes a 2. 3 times 2 is 6. This now becomes a 6, and we take that 6 and put it into the suspended computation, which is now here, because this one's finished. 6 times 4 is 24. 24 comes back to our original computation, which is down here, and it gets returned out as the final return statement of my original factorial method. The stack is now cleared. Okay. Now, the common error that you get in recursion is when you have a situation where you're trying to do your recursive call, 
but your recursive call actually isn't simplifying itself and moving its way towards the base case. If you get into a situation where you're never going to actually reach the base case, the recursive call is going to keep placing calls on the stack again and again and again and again until the computer runs out of memory and can't store any more recursive call calls causing it to crash. This will result in error messages like a stack overflow error or a heap storage exhaustion. When you see those, it means you know you've made a recursive method that is just gone forever. To solve that, you need to make sure that your algorithm is always moving towards the base case. So oftentimes when I'm trying to create a recursive method, I start by trying to figure out what is my base case and then try and make sure my recursive calls are moving towards that base case. That's it. That's all we have time for today. We'll see you in class tomorrow where we can practice what we've learned.